Hey guys, this will be video 15 for the how to design build a 59 uh, Karina Les Paul replica using Stuart McDonald templates. And uh, probably we'll talk about the templates in, in fairly extensive detail at the, at the end of this video. And, and this really should not be over a 30, 35 to 45 minute long video. Uh, because I'm just going to uh, rock it through it and keep it really light and kind of casual because uh, we're at a point now to where I'm about to glue in the neck. I won't be doing it in this video, even though it is 100% fit and it is ready. But I want to just come out of the gate and talk about the binding and how it turned out and what little bit of time I spent with it after um, I got it out of all the tape. And what you can expect to see once you get yours out of, out of the tape. And, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, making little uh, repairs and stuff like that. That should pretty much be undetectable um, in order to stretch the wood as far as you can get it. So, uh, and then I'll, then, I'll def then I'll go back to my list and try to really just mock out uh, two or three different points. And uh, point number one will be... Um, I discussed the binding in in relation to the thickness of the body, and if in case I forget, always start out a little bit fat, but this part right here has to be finished pretty early in the game, meaning this thickness right here and this pitch. You need to define that very, very soon, even before you do all the carving, and then build your guitar around those two dimensions that thickness and that pitch and hopefully i'll talk about that some more uh in, in in throughout this video but that's probably the most important part of building the whole guitar is keeping that under control and whatever happens here just build your guitar around it in other words if you get a little bit too thin then build your guitar around it but if you're too thick well then you need to cut that down so that you don't end up with a guitar that's 11 and a half pounds because you were scared to take it down another quarter, sixteenth of an inch or something like that. And then uh, we'll talk about neck alignment. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about the pitch and we'll talk about the heel widths. And then, then we'll talk about the templates and how they make your job much easier to get to this point right here. Even though that little guitar right there was built without templates um, and it turned out really, really good. But, but I had already built quite a few guitars and even a bunch of arch top guitars. So I was applying a lot of the uh, knowledge that I already had from building, you know, jazz guitars, the big body jazz guitars to just shrinking it down and uh, building that. And, uh, and it's, it's actually, if you put the two of these against each other, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of similarity, but that's a small, a little bit smaller guitar, so it's kind of scaled down. So, um, how do we, how do we build a guitar? Um, let's talk about what, how, what it looked like after it came out of the tape. I'll do a flyby. It did not look like this when it came out of the tape. Uh, it looked really, uh, well, no, I say that it looked really good. The, the, the uh, join. The flushness of the binding looked really good, so I need to be careful about saying it looked really, really bad because it did not. That looked like hell right there because it was really nasty and all glued up and funky. And in case I forget, one would never know that there's a little cap right there. So the acetone and the um, Stuart, McDonald, Stuart McDonald bind all cement, uh, that's what you can expect. Uh, virtually uh, undetectable so uh, beautiful beautiful little guitar and we were able to maintain our arch right here didn't lose that uh, I have come in uh, let me go ahead and just get the, the file up here that way I'll look down and I'll see them and I'll know to talk about them but I have not done any machining uh, like in other words I haven't put it up on a, a drill press and and you know, machine this all consistently the exact same depth. But the cool thing about it is it is the exact same depth right now. And that depth right now from the back of the guitar to the top of the binding is almost two and a sixteenth of an inch. But you can see how I've got a little bit of a lip right there. 
uh, it, it's going to go down. And even, even some of the recurve carving, once that binding drops down to my target thickness, then I'll come in with my scrapers and clean up whatever I need to clean up. And or, like this right here, I probably will come in with some tinted epoxy and just fill that in. Because this is 100% was always going to be a paint gray guitar. Okay, but the binding, uh, when it came out of the, uh, the tape, um, had some, you know, had some thumb prints on it, and some of the binding glue had gotten down into the, uh, the nitrocellulose lacquer, and a lot of that got sanded off, but, and I never clarified that in the beginning of when you're doing your priming, initially, when you're doing your initial seal coats, um, I'm not really trying to finish the guitar as much as I'm just trying to protect it from chemical and, and possibly dents and dings and stuff like that. But you also see I'm fairly religious about working off of the little fur and or construction paper um, and try to keep it elevated off the table as well. But uh, nonetheless, the, where some of the binding glue got squeezed out, it melted some of the nitro. No big deal. It got scraped with uh, the scraper right here. And the way I did it was uh, basically just came in with a fairly steep cut and just, and I, but I didn't go up here. This is really important. Don't let your uh, a scraper or razor blade or whatever it is you're using, come all the way up here and start cutting this, especially if you used a 60 thousandths binding, because you'll, you'll be all excited about getting this beautifully flush over here, only to realize that you cut off a 32nd of an inch. And now even the untrained eye would be able to look at that guitar and go, oh, wow, man, you really screwed up your binding right there. <laughs> In other words, you, you cut off a lot of your binding. So if you've got a lip, just uh, kind of take that lip off about halfway down or make the determination of, uh, maybe I'm just going to come in here and just kind of blend them together a little bit, or I'm going to chill out, and if there is a lip, I'm just going to put the tape up here, and when I start building my nitrocellulose lacquer, I'm going to build that lacquer up a little bit. There's a lot of ways you can cheat, so don't try to finish the guitar before before it's time. Be patient enough to realize that uh, I I don't I don't think I have any lips, but be patient enough to realize that uh, yeah, here's a perfect example. See how that that's overhanging. Just, just a little. Let me see if I can just get in the camera. I don't think it's going to show. Uh, but for the most part, I did a really good job about getting the route, the route depth, the appropriate depth. All of this was machined very nicely before the binding went in. And I already covered how I did the binding so that I assured that I got a real nice uh, wrap around right there when it was really, really warm, almost hot, uh, about 10 seconds away from being melted. If you kept the, you know, the gun on there, the heat gun, but, but it's still, nonetheless, it has just a very small fingernail catch right there. But the worst thing you could do is come in and start trying to shape it and sand it down and get it to blend in really beautifully because you would, you'd lose the binding. Because if you painted this guitar black or red or blue or something really vivid, uh, you're you're gonna see the you're gonna see the consistency or the inconsistency in your binding thickness. Okay, so what am I gonna do there? I'm just going to uh, obviously, you know, finish it. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that all the binding is nice and smooth and and pretty and clean. And then uh, as I'm getting closer to the finish line and I know that, yeah, I've got my thickness correct, I've got my binding where I want it, then I'm going to let the nitrocellulose lacquer build up a little bit right there. And then just uh, keep building and sanding, building and sanding. But always when you're doing your sanding, 
excuse me, when you're when you're blending the lower to the binding, just try to make a habit to not let your sandpaper get above the middle. Or, or if it does, just make certain that you're staying very flat and that you're not doing let, letting the sandpaper roll over. But there's something really strange that happens when you're doing sandpaper. Like if, if I came up here and started uh, doing this sand work and I'm really pressing really, really hard, well, what's going to happen is uh, just because our fingers are soft and the sandpaper's paper, it's going to start rolling, rolling off that edge, and it might roll that edge off prematurely. Okay, and check the time. Ten minutes of intro and binding, but that was some extremely important stuff. Uh, turned out very well. I'm extremely happy with it. Uh, that's everything about everything is exactly what I want. A little bit of a lip right there, but I still plan to take off a, a, a little bit of this height and. And I'm just going to show you how I would go about doing it. If, if you're really, really close to your finished guitar, don't risk putting this up on a machine or having some sort of uh, overhead router unless your equipment is just really high-end equipment. But uh, just, just at this point, just if you're within a 32nd of an inch but you do want it thinner, uh, just work it down with a file. And this is a, I'm, I'm using this perp on purpose because this is a, a very fine cross cut, but I've got a fairly aggressive cross cut file. And by doing this right here, it assures you that you're uh, keeping it nice and level. And then you can even you know, just, just build your guitar. You know? And typically when I'm doing this, I've got it laying directly on the paper like that and, I, and I'm, I'm doing this stuff right here and I'm letting it float a little bit right there but make certain that you've got a really good file and that your file is not hooked down or hooked up uh, because if it's hooked down you'll be filing and you won't realize it but you're tearing the guitar up back here because you're you're trying to focus on your job but then you're tearing your, your, your work up because you got a, a, a poor tool and this is a very old file, so I actually had to come in and you can see where I ground it off to make certain that when I sided down it, that it thinned out. Okay. So just build your guitar and uh, use files and sandpaper. Uh, if you're using sandpaper, uh, you, you know, you could use it on, on a block, you know, something like that right there. You guys are woodworkers, you know how to, you know how to do that stuff. Uh, so what, what, what's next? Uh, binding, binding, binding. Okay, once the binding is at this point, uh, it's still not 100% finished. That's okay. Leave it alone. Because at this point, it's time to uh, fit the neck and get the neck uh, fitted on all different points. And I'm going to go ahead and show you this so that in case I forget, uh, you'll know what, what's what's on here. And I've already done this, but the, obviously there's the center line, which is with, under the C. And then that line and that line right there represents the tenon. Now, whether it's the tenon on the neck or I actually have a little tenon that I made that is, is I'm able to put in there like that. And with this little uh, this little uh, tenon, uh, I'm able to, it, gar it, it guarantees that what I've already machined in the body can now be used to create some uh, parallel layout lines, so that I can start assessing what's going on down there. And what am I looking for? Uh, I know that because I built this body from a template, this this. Uh, uh, tenon work, mortise work down here should be perfectly on center, but if it's not, then you've got to determine how best to work around it. Do you uh, put the equipment back up there and remachine it straight? I'd recommend doing that. That's something that you should have done very early in the job. But I always knew that it was aligned very well. But, you know, by having that little block, you, you can just put that in there and then you're able to, and I love this little uh, straight edge because it has cork on the back. The cork is just awesome about really staying in place. And because I have an arch top here, 
I can raise that tenon up a little bit and I don't have to, to bend this because if you bend, you run the risk of distorting it. So you want to lay flat back there and then hold it straight right here. See what I'm saying? And then make your pin mark. Catch it on. And then make your pin mark right there. It, it, it's you might not be able to see it because of the shadow, but I can assure you, uh, I've got, I use a micro pin, and, and you can see it. And then the same thing. Lay that over there, and find that mark right there. And then, and that guarantees, well, that guarantees that those two marks are parallel <laughs> with the tenon. Now you can start assessing uh, the actual uh, tenon in relation to the actual center line or the visual center line. And what you see here with this Honduran mahogany three-piece top uh, on the very front end, I intentionally made certain that this centerpiece was perfectly on center with the guitar. But had had something have happened, uh, let's create a hypothetical here and say, let's say we had a large piece of mahogany um, and we were going to do some distress work on the guitar and expose a lot of that mahogany and we wanted to be able to see it through the, the paint or, or maybe we weren't even hardly going to paint it but we were going to do all this paint work down here, well, then you might have had to have built your top up with this off center or something in order, in order to assure that you don't have a join up here, that it's a solid piece. Okay. That should make perfect sense. But, uh, but if you do do that, always make certain that you make some sort of note, even if you have to come in here and write it in the body, Hey man, this this center that is not that rally stripe is not the center. It it is one eighth of an inch off because I just barely had enough material to build the guitar anyway. But if I had have put it in here, it would have been too short, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But don't don't get lost in your own visual guitar and uh, and lay it out or, or or get confused when you put this in and nothing starts aligning. And I, and I hated to go off a tangent there and, and spend too much talking, time talking about it. But uh, the only reason I bring it up is because I do that kind of, you know what, all the time where I'm stretching lumber and sometimes I don't put things on center. I'll, I'll have a center line a quarter of an inch off and uh, just to make it work if it's paint gray. Uh, these, this little mark here, this little mark here represents uh, what I call the trapezoidal path of the fretboard. That, that, in other words, if your fretboard is um, a one and three quarter inch nut and it's two and three sixteenths inch wide at the sixteenth fret <clears throat> at a certain scale, that trapezoidal path is going to flare out a certain dimension. So on that note, uh, this is where you can come in and just build it up. Just anything, just, but you want whatever you put in there to be very, uh, very true. And then see, you've already, you've already fit your neck about, uh, about a 99% fitment where you know that, uh, you know, that as, as you're verifying all of these layout lines up here, that you're not off a sixteenth of an inch or something crazy down here because very rarely do you just machine this body and machine this neck even per template and then they just fit together perfectly. It doesn't happen. Uh, I've gotten really, really close before so much so that it shocked me, but nine times out of ten I'm spending between four to six hours uh, fitting, fitting my neck in. Okay, now obviously the neck is going to drop down the thickness of those two uh, Allen wrenches, but what what these two, what this mark and this mark here represents, is the continuation of the flare. Okay, in other words, from the nut all the way down, and I would recommend uh, this is just from like a, a company called Harbor Freight. I think it's like ten dollars, fifteen dollars. But it's a very nice, clean aluminum straight edge. I use that right there. 
and then I verify, you know, my flare. And then once, once I verify that my tenon is on center, my trapezoidal flare of my fretboard is consistent, I know that I'm ready to glue this neck in and and not have to shim it. If I'm if I'm off a little bit, then I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm I'm gonna come in here and, and I'm gonna relieve a little bit of material on one of the sides of the heel that probably isn't in the camera. I'm gonna relieve some of the material off one of the sides of the heel in order to get the neck to kind of uh, start moving a little bit. Uh, and then I maybe come in here and do a little bit of sanding right here to get it to, to have a little bit more room to travel, but not letting it get off right here. I'm really going off on a hypothetical tangent here, but I just want you to understand that once you start building your guitar, uh, it's very unlikely that it's going to just bolt together or f uh, put together, you know, slip together and be perfectly. Uh, it, it should. It'll be very, very close. But uh, the, in case I didn't cover it, by doing that, the trapezoidal flare goes up. I did. And I, I make a mark there. I make a mark there. And then I start uh, determining, you know, what, what, what are those marks doing, even in relation to the tenon. Because, see, if there's something weird about your neck, let's say your tenon is perfectly centered and all this jazz, but you, you're too... Uh, you're too fat on this side. You might be one and three quarter your target, but you're fat on this side. Well, then you'll you'll know that once you start fitting your fretboard, well, certainly don't don't let your fretboard get off in in the wrong side because if anything, you're you're going to want to be able to take material off this side, so you're going to want your fretboard up here, okay? And I'm going to stop creating hypotheticals, but. Again, if you're if you guys are watching my video series, uh, it, it's it's vocational. You know, we're talking about uh, things that happen in the shop when you're you're when you're all excited about building your guitar, but then uh, you know, then you run into this hiccup, and, and you're trying to determine, oh man, how do I correct either this or that or one thing or the other. And probably my first 15 or 20 guitars, it was all about, oh, God, how do I overcome what just happened, <laughs> you know? And uh, anyway, uh, not being dramatic or, or negative or anything, but use little, uh, use little things like that right there. Little blocks of wood or, you know, to help build up your neck while it's in the pocket. And then uh, this was about ready to glue in. Let me check my. Let me check the time. Tw Twenty three minutes. Uh, let's talk about making some quick repairs and and why I love working with the Karina and why I decided uh, I'm going to start working with the Karina even more. And I want you to. I wish I had have shown this before I made the repair because even I was not expecting. I was not expecting this to, well, I actually I take that back and I'm not being arrogant, but I was, I knew that it was not going to be a visible uh, repair. Okay. I'll go ahead and lay it where, where it was. Okay. Just imagine that little piece right there had to be glued in right there. Now, and what it was based on is the fact that when I was doing the, the route work, uh, yeah, when I was doing the route work and the router bit came across here, remember I was working with just minimal amount of, of material. Well, the, the router, it tore out just, just a little bit, just enough to piss me off. And it was so frustrating because I had done such a good job of making certain that I had this machined really perfectly. But nonetheless, it, it tore out right there. And this is this relates back to what I said about when things happen, don't freak out, just just cross that bridge later on. Well, that was like months ago. And every time I would pick this neck up to think about finishing this guitar, I'd look at that tear out and go, you son of a oh. and it would just really irked me that I knew it was gonna be one more thing that I was gonna have to deal with. 
that might not I might not be able to overcome. But I did, and it's quite beautiful. And, and truth be known, I can't even tell where the repair is. Why? Because I'm really good about keeping up with uh, all of my drops and material from when I'm taking when I'm building a guitar and I'm trying to label things. But even obviously, since this is quarter sewn right here. I'm sitting here, um, I, I don't know if that's showing up on the camera, but I look at that and go, whoop, nope, wrong. It goes like this, or either it goes like this. And then I started finding the piece that was from the tree or from the board, and I found that location just spot, so much spot on. It was perfectly quarter sewn. And then I came in with my little pole saw, and I cut out a little, little, uh, a little uh, trough. Yeah, I guess the trough would be the word. But I only took it down uh, as far as I had to in depth, which it wasn't quite that much in depth that I took it down, but it was enough to uh, realign the uh, actual growth rings. Uh, and why do I why do I say that you spend have to spend a whole lot of time with this? Because I've got guitars upstairs that I built 15 years ago. And I'll pick them up and I'll see imperfections that I did not take the time to correct. So if you're building a guitar that I, you're either trying to sell or either you, you're giving to someone that you care about, well, then, you, you you know, if you have to make a repair, then you have to make a repair. But uh, do that repair as, as good as you can. And, uh, and I think that turned out really well. And then uh, after it's all said and done, then you come in with your wire brush very much work with the grain uh, kind of just encourage it a little bit and then uh, and now she's ready to fit in to the body and the cool thing about my try to hold on to this little body can't see it there's it's impossible I don't I don't oh yeah it's funny I was looking down here and it's actually up there so very cool. It turned out really well, but you didn't want to, You wouldn't want to just grab up any old piece of material and put in there because you'll get a color variation. Uh, why do I say this? Because there have been times when uh, I've had to make re repairs on fretboards between two different frets on a vintage guitar, and uh, you you know you had no choice but for it to be perfect and just just completely disappear. Let's see how good this looks. I think this, I think this looks, it's about 99% fit. It's real close. I think I've already shown this. So anyway, in other words, this is ready to glue in. After a little bit more fitment. And I'm glad I'm just going off the tangent here. If, if you saw that you had a little bit of a gap right there, and it's nice and tight over here, then what you can do just let that fall. It should, should fall off the table. Uh, just take some 120. It needs to be good paper. Uh, and then clamp this body to your work table. And I like working off this high table. Let the body hang off the edge of the table. And then you can just stoop down on your hands and knees and just pull that out a little bit. And I'm going to do it in reverse. But it's kind of like... Uh, I don't know if it's so tight. Then, then you're then you're just pulling through. Sit like that right there, and you'd be surprised how quickly uh, uh, one or two one or two pulls. This is hard to do. Let me see if I can catch it. So, so now you're just pulling straight up, and and you're getting that little bit of wood on there, and you'll be surprised how quickly it'll just go zip, and it'll just fit that perfectly into place. And the cool thing about using that flexible sandpaper is if your body has a little bit of distortion to it, well then that sandpaper will follow that distortion and it, it might, I'm gonna exaggerate, but it might sand your, it might sand your neck on a, on a it might sand the heel on a um, concave in order to meet a convexed body. 
And why do I say that? As I, as I was making that statement, I was thinking of a 1957 Gretsch 6120 um, hollow body uh, guitar that I bought that uh, I, was, I couldn't sleep. I was so excited about getting that guitar. Paid $1,400 for it. It was a horrific basket case, but the body was beautiful. The neck had been ripped out of it. And the body was beautiful up here, but it was all torn to hell over here, and I had to repair it. But it had it had a bit of a, a convex to it. So when I fit the neck, I had to cut it on a concave in order to get it to marry up, so that visually, once they went together, uh, I didn't have to take a lot. I didn't have to sand any material off the body to try to flatten it up, or I didn't lose any of the heel of the neck. Okay. And I'm going to stop <laughs> because uh, I could talk for hours about that type of stuff because uh, that's typically what's going to happen when you're doing restoration. But when you're building new, we get to make certain that we do a perfectly square cut and we keep everything nice and true. Hence the reason I mentioned when you first get this body roughed out, this top roughed out, glued on, and it's all thick and massive work from that plane, that uh, dim that dimension and that plane and that plane and once you achieve that uh, mark it off with little skulls and crossbones if you have to so that you stay away from those areas and then as you're building your neck you're building your neck fitting it to that body and then if you run into a problem you have to make the determination well what do I change and, and if you had a real fat, massive heel and plenty of length from here to here, I would say change the heel. But in my situation with this right here, I was right at the threshold of getting the, you, you may not believe it, but the, the board that you're looking at, it was just barely long enough to even get the scale by the time it started uh, pitching downward. So I had one shot at getting this heel right for the reason why I got pissed off when I tore that out because I knew, oh man, that's just great. I don't have a 16th of an inch to work with because that's, that's the minimum heel right there. And, and I learned my lesson when I, after I made that tear out right there, I came in over here and I shot jet glue all in here and all in here, the CA glue, I flooded it and I turned it into like a rock hard piece of maple. Then when I machined this side, it didn't tear out. So when you're, when you're getting ready to cut this with a miter saw, just think about your blade is going to be exiting, uh, exiting the cut on that side right there. Well, then shoot some um, CA glue, thin CA glue right in there and kind of stiffen that up so that when you make that cut, it doesn't tear out. Why do I say that? Because that did happen. It tore out on one of these sides. I can see it. I had to make a small repair right there as well because it flaked out the whole side. This is what I meant by I was talking to one, a potential client and I was explaining to him, uh, most people have no idea uh, how difficult Karina is to work with, but once you understand it, it's an incredible wood to work with. Um, it just it works really well, but it's notorious for being extremely dry, splitting and uh, tearing out really bad. And, and, I, and I've got really precision uh, saw blades. It wasn't that I had, was using a cheap saw blade. Okay. All right. Uh, let me check the time again. 33 minutes. Uh, what should I talk about? Let me look at my list here. Uh, discuss binding. Neck alignment, pitch, and heel fitment. Discuss the templates. Neck alignment and pitch heel. So we talked about the alignment uh, and this, I've talked about this before. Uh, if any of you guys out there are into aviation, I, re I relate this to, to roll, pitch, and, and yaw. Okay? It's like flying an airplane. Uh, once you get, uh, what's the most important thing? Most important, the most important thing to me personally is, is, the, uh, is the yaw. You want to get the, the, the center line of your neck perfectly aligned with the center line of the body. So that would be the yaw. Once we get the yaw under control, then, uh, then we can start dealing with the pitch. And then once we get the pitch real nice and precise, or at least real close, 
Now, probably you want to go to the center line then and make certain that you get the neck where you want because you might have screwed up when you when you rough this out and you might be a sixteenth of an inch too deep and then or, or maybe your tenon is off a little bit and you've got to make the determination are you going to build up the tenon and with you know like a real thin piece of 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 a shim um, I wouldn't if I screwed that up and I was off a sixteenth of an inch and I hadn't machined this yet. I would machine that a sixteenth of an inch off so that nobody looks down in my guitar and sees, sees a sixteenth of an inch sham. That's just me. I don't do that though now because uh, I know what I'm doing and I can do it without the templates, but because I have this template that guarantees that I have a, a center line that I'm working off of, I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. So if there's something screwy about my fitment, it certainly is not Stuart McDonald. It's something that I did. So fortunately, if you're working from those templates, you're probably going to get a really good alignment on the frame. So uh, yaw first, pitch, and then the roll. And the roll was achieved very early on the front end when you had your uh, routing template atop this guitar you 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 triple checked and guaranteed that you didn't have this tipped low or even worse if it was tipped this way and i've talked about this before i learned this from robert benedetto some guys actually uh, they actually roll their neck about a half a degree especially for big body arch top jazz guitar where that top is moving uh, and i get it because sometimes, and I can't, I, I'm not going to try to think because I'll get it wrong, but in certain seasons, uh, that top, it, well, it's uh, wet seasons, the top swell up, and that, no, I'm wrong, I'm going to stop, because in real dry seasons, that top will fall, and you'll have to raise that bridge really high, and you'll look down the guitar, and your bridge, if, you're, if, you're, if your neck, if you had screwed up your neck and you got it off this way, Man, the bridge looks like it's an eighth of an inch higher over here than it is on this side. So, you're because you're trying to get the bigger strings, the E and, and the and the E and the A, especially uh, to uh, clear more ha have more clearance. Whereas the thinner strings on the, the lower side, uh, they're not as likely to buzz. So some guys will roll their necks, uh, even in the small body guitars. Uh, that's pretty advanced guitar building because now it affects everything. And if you were going to do that, make certain that you build your heel big enough that you're able to show, shape it. And when I talk about rolling, uh, I mean maybe a half a degree, maybe one degree, if that. But none of these guitars that we're, we're talking about building here, are they rolled? The Fenders are not rolled. The Les Pauls are not rolled. The Gretsch guitars, they are not rolled. That typically just re relates to really big body jazz guitars that have, you know, Sitka spruce, well, any any type of wooden top. It's typically a spruce European or Sitka spruce, and they have a, they are notorious for a lot of movement. Okay, so, and I, and I that was probably too much information, but then again, um, I think it's good to talk about those things because sometimes you'll trip up on a forum and where a forum where someone will talk about, you know, oh yeah, if you you know maybe roll your neck a little bit, well you better know what you're doing on the front end because let's say that this was the the template where you were you were routing out that uh, mortise and let's say you were going to roll it. Um, get yourself in a lot of trouble. I would strongly recommend keeping it flat so that once your uh, one and three quarter inch long bit, once it's following a, a line up here, the cut at the bottom is not a sixteenth of an inch off or it's not exponentially off. You want it to be very much uh, square and true. That ought to make perfect sense. That's all, all I'm saying is you want that negative space, that mortise, to be perfectly, um, you know, square with everything about the body, okay? And uh, so roll, we had our, we had the yaw, and we talked about the roll, and then we talked, I did not talk about the pitch, probably the most important thing after all that's said and done. Uh, you screw up this pitch, then you're going to end up with a really high or really, really low um, 
bridge. And at this point, just as I've mentioned, just keep it four degrees. Uh, these templates show um, that came from Stuart McDonald. Um, they have this one at four, um, 85.6 degrees. Oh God, why would that be? I'll do the math. 90 minus 85.6. So if it was, if it were 90 minus 86, that's four degrees. It's like 4.4 degrees. Oh, that to me that that's too steep. And what I'm talking about is is uh, there's this, is like a 4.4 degree pitch. I don't pitch that high. That that's an extremely high pitch. I pitch four degrees. And a lot of the guys, let me see if I can just get this in the camera without dropping this body. Okay, just take a look. Take a look at what we got here. See how we have the little hook. All I'm doing is just putting that in, but I'm trying to figure out how to hold this so you can see it. Yeah, this will probably work right here. So difficult to do this stuff on camera. Okay, so all I'm talking about is getting that pitch properly cut. And that pitch is determined by, you know, just your jig. Uh, and if you, uh, once you, once you f have this flat right here, and you know that that flat on the surface is perfect, well, then you're able to allow the, 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 the base of your router to just follow that, and, and you're in good shape. So all you're doing is just, you know, trying to keep the mortise uh, nice and square. Um, on the center line vertically and that that allows you to cover your uh, roll pitch and yaw axes of installation of your neck okay time 41 minutes for some reason I just can't keep them under uh, under 45 minutes but you know I don't know that's not such a bad thing for some people uh, because some guys that are well as I've mentioned before it's for a worthy cause let's leave it at that <laughs> because again if I'm really considering doing this uh, if you've done the math at all the calculations uh, you're gonna have a minimum of about a thousand dollars in your raw material to build a custom guitar and that's just the raw material I'm not talking about the electricity bill, the time away from family or friends or work or whatever the things that you could be doing. Uh, there's you, you can't really justify building your own guitar <laughs> if, you're, if you're trying to save money. Forget it; it's it's not going to happen. But uh, by the time you spent all that money on all that stuff, I would rather hear someone just ramble on and on and on about war stories about things that went wrong and 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 how how close I came to tearing off the whole corner of that hill. Here's a little trivia for you and then I, and then I'll let you go. Otherwise, pay attention. This is extremely important. All right. It's pretty, right? It's really good. See anything? If you're paying attention, you do. See that right there? That right there? When I was doing, when I was routing this body, I came around this corner. The, the router bit, I was biting a little bit too deep. The router bit caught the wood right there because this notorious uh, uh, Karina Limba had a little bit of a of a split in it, and that piece was loose. And when the router bit caught it, it ripped it completely out all the way back and all the way back right there. I couldn't even find the piece. It threw it on the other side of the, the shop. And I and when that happened, I would literally came unglued. I was so pissed off. And I'll just be straight. I'll go straight to the finish line. I was furious because every time I build a guitar, if I'm going to lose guitar, it always happens right there. So just proceed with extreme caution, but know that that, that a lot of times you're going to be making repairs and it worked really well. I used a, a tight bond to glue that piece back in. It was a beautiful controlled break, but it did, there was it, the only, I couldn't find that little piece right there. <laughs> so if anything, I could come in and, and put a, glue a little fill it in right there, but uh, I'm going to leave it. Uh, I'm going to leave it just to remind me that I'm not perfect. And, but when things do go awry, 
don't freak out. Don't, don't, don't table the job because uh, it's still a beautiful guitar and I couldn't allow that one screw up to uh, kill my spirit for building the guitar. And as soon as it happened, shut everything down. I, I wasn't even finished doing in the routing. I was in, I was mid ship routing. No, I take that back. I actually did finish all the other routing, but I made certain that I got nowhere near any of that. And then I glued that piece back in and it's this, so the body's all routed nice and pretty down here, or at least rough out. And then on this chunk is glued back in, uh, clamped, you know, from here to here, from here to here. And, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I might've even built some sort of straight edge something over here to make certain that my clamp, I didn't have to worry about my clamps breaking loose, but I had about four to five hours in that repair, just doing the repair. And then it had to dry overnight. You building 10 of these, you can't, that, that's not an option, okay? So, anyway, uh, I'm glad I went off the tangent and talked about that stuff because the Karina is extremely difficult to work with, and, and th those bit, that bit was brand new. I specifically remember buying those two new bits to build the 58 Explorer replica, so it's not like I was working with uh, crappy bits there. Okay, so we check the list here. We, we cover, I didn't get to talk about the templates much, and I apologize. Uh, let me check the time. We're at 46 minutes. If you're still here, it means you're building the guitar. Uh, all right. Let's say you, let's say you got a, a flat board. <laughs> And, and, and you're you're going to make the determination that you're either going to do P90s or you're going to do uh, humbuckers and you're going to go with a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale and you know exactly what you want. Well, if you order these templates, uh, they are not cheap, but as I've mentioned, man, I can build anything. I knew that once I bought these templates, I was going to be able to build just about anything. So the good thing that I like about these templates is once I have, and I've already covered this, but because it's clear, there's a, a there there are four holes here. There are two for the bridge, and there's two for the tailpiece. And once you, now I'm going to flip this back over. Okay, there's one for the the. Uh, bridge and there's the other for the bridge that it's got a, a fillet in it and there's the one for the tail and then one for the tail right there that's filled in. I can't remember why I filled those back in. Uh, I might have I might have got worried that it got off a little bit but uh, once you get this thing aligned to where you want it, uh, see it has a score down the, down the middle and once you get this template where you want it this is before these holes were drilled but once you get these uh, this template aligned with the guitar that you want then you're able to take that over to the drill press and drill these four holes if you're undecided about the bridge or that you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm going to go with a wraparound. Well, then only drill these two up here, because the last thing you want to do is have a beautiful book matched maple that you elect to go with just the wraparound bridge. But now you've got these two holes that you drilled back here that you've got to figure out how to how to conceal. And with this guitar, it didn't matter because I knew it was going to be paint gray. But just always be thinking a step ahead of yourself. Okay, so working with these templates, uh, once I uh, temporarily fastened this template atop this wood, this could have been a Les Paul Jr., you know, with a flat top. It didn't have to be arch top. Obviously, it was not arch to begin with. It was flat. But then once I had that center line and those two points drilled, man, I was ready to rock and roll. And what I did is I came in here. I'm not going to spend any time talking about this. But when I build a guitar, I always do the initial rough out for um, worst case, either case scenario. With this rough out right here, I can either go with P90s or I can go with humbuckers. And that's why it's a funky looking route. 
the P90 will go all the way to that back point there or all the way to that front ledge, same as the um, humbucker. But the humbucker will, if I go with the humbuckers, then I'll be routing out excessive material up here, which I'll be going with humbuckers on this guitar. But then you're able to use these templates. And once you drill those two holes, now you're able to transfer uh, from that template to this template and route out your tenon because see you have four holes back here as well that you simply I mean it's just uh, walk in the park man uh, these are bamboo skewers that seem to work perfectly and then what the, the what's going to guarantee that you do a really good job here is you're just you've marked a center line a, def, a very defined center line on the body top right there and then that's then you're looking at the score in this location here, and you're guaranteeing that that you're that you're getting that template um, perfectly where you want it, and uh, you're not too concerned about uh, flatness right now, but you, you know you probably should be. That top that is glued up there should be. It should be machined, you know, it should be fairly nice so that you could lay that, uh, so that you could actually crank up your router and go ahead and route the whole mortise. And that would guarantee that your mortise, as I was talking about earlier, that would guarantee that your mortise was perfectly square with the initial flat top, which you would also be parallel with the back. In other words, that, that bottom right there should be parallel with the back, okay? And then once you have that in place, then you change over to the other bit, and then you run your uh, uh, harness channel, you know, route right through all the body for the control cavity. Uh, I do not go all the way through my bodies when I'm doing the control cavity. We'll cover that in some other videos, but for the most part, they, they, they just go directly through the lower. I call that the lower. Uh, they go all the way through the lower, and then that defines that right there. Okay, so, but if you elected to go with uh, P90s, then uh, this is additional. I think this is about $65 but you still have the, uh, well, I take that back. You, you do have the tailpiece locations, which is a little bit odd, but it did not have the bridge locations. So I drilled the bridge location myself, but I screwed up. I had this template upside down. Uh, it doesn't matter, but, but nonetheless, uh, if you were gonna go with P90s, now you see my point. See now, I've, if I'm going with P90s, I'm going to be routing out material back here, or I'm going to be routing out material up there. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's just something I came up with on my own because I like having that open pocket there to allow any uh, epoxy to squeeze out because I epoxied the top down. But so within just a matter of seconds, I was able to change my mind from humbuckers and, and build this guitar P90s with P90s if I want, just by having those templates, okay? So, as the video says, building a 59 Carino Les Paul replica using Stuart McDonald templates, uh, man, are they ever, are they ever so valuable. Uh, they're not cheap, I can't remember what it was, it might have been like three to four hundred dollars for the whole set, or it might have just been like 260 to 300 or something like that. But I've literally built, uh, uh, I don't even know how many guitars I've built the last two years with them. Uh, five or six, maybe. Maybe more. Okay. Um, sorry for such a long video, but uh, I hope you got a lot of good information out of it. And uh, just, uh, just build your guitar. And uh, if you got any questions or comments, let me know. I'll be happy to help out as much as I can. I'll check the time. Otherwise, 54 minutes uh, set a long video record. So... I'm going to stop talking, and I'll see you guys in the next video. And in that next video, um, probably we'll be gluing the neck in. Yeah, I will. And I'll show you how I go about doing that. 
and this is going to be uh, this is going to throw you a curveball. Uh, I epoxy glue my necks in, and most people would frown upon that. But uh, since you're still here, uh, I'm going to spend just about one more minute with this. My theory is this: uh, I get a, when I list a guitar for sale, a certain guitar. You wouldn't believe how many people uh, contact me and go, "Hey, you know, I've got a, a 1962 Gibson SG, blah, 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 pick your poison, and uh, I need a neck replacement." And they'll send me these pictures of a guitar that took a, a catastrophic fall, and and maybe it cracked the neck, but it, it blew the the neck loose from the body. And I'm thinking of an Explorer. A guy sent me some pictures of a 60s, I'm sorry, a 76 Explorer, limited edition. And it was all uh, broken loose just at the finish. Uh, so that was because that neck was just glued in with traditional glues. Nothing wrong with that at all. But now, the, now not only does he have a, a catastrophic headstock break that's got to be repaired, but he's also got to have the neck pulled out. So my theory is this, if I'm going to, if I'm going to slip up, I almost made the statement, if I'm going to be stupid enough to drop my guitar, then uh, it is what it is. But uh, if, if I drop this guitar, I want to break the headstock completely off. I want the headstock to blow off the stage, but I want this to stay intact. Or you want to know the truth? I don't even have a problem if it broke the neck up here. I can repair all that stuff. But... But if this thing takes a blow, and I got uh, water-based glue down here that blows loose just enough to F up the job, well, guess what I get to do now? Um, I got to take the fretboard off. And I probably have to repair a fretboard that is cracked because the lower blue broke loose from its um, piss-poor joinery where it was all sloppy, sloppily built by the initial builder. So now I got to pull the fretboard off, get this baby out, only to realize, oh great, there's nothing wrong with it at all. If the glue had just been strong enough to have held it in place like a through body construction design, then all this up here probably would have been salvageable and not even affected. And all I would have been doing was just traditional headstock repair. Even if, you know, even if you're cutting the whole headstock off and rebuilding it. Okay, so I like the epoxy. Uh, I typically don't do that for uh, clients, though, because they, they don't understand that reasoning, and it scares them, and I'm okay with that. I just hope they don't break their guitars. But uh, I like to epoxy my guitars in because it definitely affects the tone as well. Okay, so this video is getting way, way too long. I'm not even going to check the time. I'm just going to stop talking. But I like using epoxy, and so don't be in shock if you, or don't go into shock if you see me using the epoxy in the next video to glue that neck in. All right, thanks guys, and I'll see you in the next video.